And now, please welcome back to the stage, Dave Georgeson. I need this thing. So, welcome back. It's <laughs> And for those of you who weren't there uh, the last, uh, last hour, ha, 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 you missed stuff. <laughs> but uh, EverQuest Next, well, we, uh, we haven't been talking about it a lot since last SOE Live, and that's because uh, we've been real busy with Landmark. But all of that is about to change. Um, but since it has been a long time since we talked about EverQuest Next, we thought we, we would uh, put together a quick refresher video for you. And when I say quick, I mean don't blink. Okay, you got all that right. I don't need to talk about what happened last year. <laughs> all right, so the number one question that we've been getting for the entire last year is, when are you guys gonna start building EverQuest next? And the answer is, well, we are building it and we're building it right in front of you and we've been doing it the entire time. Um, there's a reason why MMOs are not real prevalent. They're not like tons and tons of them around, and that's because when you want to simulate a whole world of action, you have to build a lot of systems. And so you may not realize it, but we've been making all of those systems that we need for EverQuest Next, and we've been doing it right in front of you in Landmark. You see, the new Norath needs to be a real wonder to adventure through. And that means it needs things like ancient ruins and deep caverns to explore, and you need to have oceans and lakes that are really cool and you just beg for you to dive and explore them. We also need a thriving economy that's based on player interactions and a, cra and a, um, a, a solid crafting foundation. Character classes in EverQuest, uh, EverQuest Next, have special weapons that give them abilities. And if you play Landmark, that should be really familiar. Grappling hooks, movement systems, things like that. Um, and it's not an MMO without social interaction. We've got to have guilds and groups. They're an absolute must-have. And we're also experimenting with social hubs that you can check anywhere in your life at any time. In addition, uh, we, want to have, um, we want land to be a highly prized reward in EverQuest Next so that guilds can uh, work together to create uh, halls and towns with intense player cooperation. And the claim stuff that you see in Landmark is the basis of that. And although the tools that we, um, are, that we have in Landmark are not the focus of EverQuest Next, they do allow us to fulfill the dream of building the new Norath with you guys so that we can create something that's truly majestic. And for those of you who did see the landmark keynote, all of that stuff we just introduced in the last hour is completely useful in EverQuest Next, every single bit of it. So we are building this game right in front of you. But now let's talk about the fundamentals, the holy grails that I mentioned last year when we talked about the five key differences uh, between our game and every other game you've ever played. The first of those holy grails is the fully destructible world. And Landmark's got that in spades. In fact, the only thing that we haven't made destroyable so far is player-placed uh, props. And that's becoming destroyable very soon. So very soon, we'll have the 100% destroyable world that we set out to make. Then we also had the tiers of depth. So all those caves and caverns below the ground that go all the way down to the core, we've been experimenting with those, and they're working great. And as we extend those out and start adding procedural content, we'll have all the systems that we need for EverQuest next. Also, the emergent AI. Now, we talked about this last year, but haven't shown you anything for a long time. Make sure you go to the panel on Saturday, the AI panel, because we, the, what we're doing with Storybricks and how we're making these worlds come to life is truly unique, and we can show you some of the early demos of that technology at that panel. Additionally, there's also rallying calls. Now, these are EverQuest Next only. This is the specific secret sauce that we use for EverQuest Next to roll out the stories and the, and the plot lines and the characters and all the stuff that'll be fully immersive for you in the EverQuest Next worlds. And then there's also the fifth grail, which of course was changing the core gameplay. And we're doing that in spades. Now, we're gonna talk a little bit about other things before we get to it, but the second half of this presentation is all about that. So you'll see a lot of that today. Good so far? Cool. 
So the game's coming together. We've been making great progress on uh, features and systems, but we also want to talk about lore and background. What, what, what about the races and the places and the people of Norath? Well, we've been doing a lot of work with that, and uh, to tell you what we're doing and how we're moving forward, we're going to bring forth uh, Steve Denuser, the lore master and dream keeper of EverQuest Next in Landmark. Take it away, Steve. Hey there. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. So we've said from the beginning that EverQuest Next isn't a sequel, it isn't a prequel to any game that's come before, but it's a reimagining of the franchise. What this allows us to do is to look at the entire EQ universe and pick our favorite stories, our favorite characters, and introduce those, wrap them up with new content into an all-new continuity. We built tens of thousands of years of history for Norath, not to tell you just about the world's past, but to set the stage for storylines that will play out years after the game launches. And because EverQuest Next is a different kind of, of game, we wanted to take a different approach with how we unveiled the lore of the world. And we've done that through stories. So we've worked with a talented team of writers, Maxwell Alexander Drake, Robert Lassen, and R.T. Kalin, who together have, yeah, deserve applause. We got fans of the e-books out there? Fans of the books? All right, awesome. Uh, so these, together, these folks have put together over 100,000 words of original and really high-quality content stories. And we've only just begun. So in the months to come, we're going to introduce new stories that feature characters, some of which will be familiar to fans of the franchise, and others that will be totally new to you. And all of this leads up to the biggest story of all, the one that sets the stage for day one of your character's adventures in EverQuest Next. So we're really proud of the work that these folks have done. All these stories are available for you to download on the everquestnext.com website. Just look on the media tab. And these are all free of charge. Uh, as I said, we're going to keep releasing new stories all the time up to the game's launch and beyond. So we're really excited about that. I also want to encourage you to come later today to a panel on story and lore that we have at 3 PM, where we'll take a deep dive into each of these stories. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Dave. If you haven't read those stories, I, I highly recommend it. It's good stuff. If you're a fantasy reader, you'll love this stuff. So anyway, in addition to story, there's music. And we're working with Jeremy Soule, who's this fantastic composer many of you are familiar with. Um, and he's creating a backbone of emotion for us, a soundtrack that's second to none for our game. And so let me introduce to you Jeremy Soule, the music director for EverQuest Next in Landmark. My friend, Jeremy Soule. How you doing? So 100,000 words, that translates to about 27,000 keystrokes per completed minute of music. And uh, I think we're well over, well, coming up on four hours of music in uh, Landmark, and we're going to have that and more in uh, EQN. Um, for me, story is music, and music is story. And we're literally interchangeable in terms of language. Music, I believe, is the universal language. And, and as I read words, somehow there's a magic machine that converts that to music. And it would take me hours and hours, and they'd kick me off the stage if to, if to explain how that's done. But I think that's something that'll be the focus of some of our updates is uh, the process. So you can see what we're doing and, and uh, how we do it. And, and uh, I'm working with some wonderful live musicians on this project. So you'll be hearing uh, more about that. And uh, there's a lot of technology that goes into the music. Um, what we have is something called virtual instruments. And it's a lot like models or animation or the particle systems and, and all the cool stuff you see in graphics. We have sort of their counterparts in, in music. And so uh, we've been developing, I think, a lot of very exciting sounds and textures. And of course, we have the traditional orchestra you know, ready with the battle sword and everything else. But, uh, uh, my goal is, is we, as the game becomes more otherworldly, especially when you get into, uh, into the, the, the sunken realms, I like to call them, uh, we're going to be developing equally otherworldly music. And uh, in, for instance, one example is we take the sound of whales, and that turns into a musical instrument somehow. And you'll, you'll see. 
in the next little while. That's really cool. So uh, Jeremy's been working on, uh, of course, we've been adding combat recently to Landmark, and so we've been also dabbling with other ideas and stuff for EverQuest Next. And Jeremy's created a theme for some of the uh, action-oriented music that we have here for you also. And I wanted to explain, you're about to see this video, that's actually Jeremy's studio, the treehouse in Hollywood. They don't come more talented than this guy. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank I appreciate you. your time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So these are the kinds of things that we do to build up the backbone of our, uh, our, our emotional involvement into the game. Um, and it's great. Um, but we've also been uh, giving out lore to our players in different ways. Like recently, we've been uh, running foundation workshops in Landmark for both the Dark Elf and the Karen cultures. And what that means is we've been giving the players there all of our concept art, our uh, style guides, and our cultural concepts, and then turning them loose on it so that we can watch them make it better than we could anticipate. And they really, really have done that. The collaboration has been so successful that we're now moving through all of the races with our players to get all of their feedback and input and there is nothing about this process that we don't love. So what I'm going to show you now is a video that shows you some of the Dark Elf Foundation winners um, as well as some of the promising build outs that are in the Karen workshop that's running right now. We really wanted to show you that video because it's proof that you guys are already changing the world of Norath. So right now I want to bring up Jeff Butler, the creative director for EverQuest Next and Landmark, and Rosie Rappaport, the art director for uh, EverQuest Next and Landmark, to, tell you, uh, to show you a live tour of what happens when the players work with the devs to collaborate and create something amazing. So come on up, Jeff and Rosie. Thanks. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Talk about the proof of what you guys have been able to accomplish. Working with you all, Rosie and I, in the Dark Elf workshop and the Karen workshop has been absolutely amazing. Three years ago, she and I sat in her office and brainstormed about how incredible it could be to put the hands of the developer into your, your arms and to allow you to join together with us to develop games. And here we see the result the first Dark Elf City live in the game. 
We knew that what you would be able to do with that power would be amazing, but this is an achievement beyond all of our expectations. There were so many amazing builds, and um, we're going to see, we've seen in the video, and here we can see uh, many of the different players that built different pieces. And the way that we did that so it all came together was we created a style guide, and then we gave it out to you guys, and we got feedback, and we gave feedback, and we sort of honed what the Dark Elf style was, and then we ran a competition. Um, and we took those pieces, we wanted to take them and put them together in this citadel for you to see that they all go together so amazingly, which is really an amazing accomplishment that you guys did. This is an inspired work and an amazing collaboration on all of your parts. We really look forward to the future of building Norath with you in Landmark and going forward. Uh, and we really wanted to give a special thanks to the contest entrants whose winners, whose entries we chose here in this Dark Elf City. And they include Bride, Ginsan, Hadder. If you guys are here, hopefully, I'm not sure, come up, we Stand wanna up. meet you. Anzul. Yeah. Fugazid and or Fugazi, his alt, and Andrew. Thank you. And our thanks to all the people, not only these entrants, but the people who have built in the Karen workshop, the people who build outside of the workshops, and all of you who inspire us every day with your creativity. It is an honor to work with you. Thanks. Thank you. I keep almost missing this thing. That would be just Boy, the exclamation point on the presentation. <laughs> All right, so uh, that was cool stuff, and you can see how the players are absolutely uh, um, being involved in the creation of the new Norath and making a really big impact. So that's great progress on our systems, our lore, our music, and our style. But what about the core gameplay? Because that's really what you came here to check out was core gameplay. So EverQuest Next is designed to feel alive and ever-changing. We do this by constantly pulsing new story arcs throughout the world all the time, allowing you, the players, to choose what you, uh, what you deal with and what you don't. You create permanent change in the world by deciding what stories you pursue, uh, both on an individual and a community level. The worlds that you uh, play on will quickly develop into unique microcosms, and you determine their paths. But that's the big concept. And to get to it, let's start a little smaller and kind of go through the life of a character. So we'll create a new character and we'll pick a race. So last year, of course, we showed you the, uh, the Karens and the humans. You saw those. Um, this year, we decided to show you another race. And uh, the obvious choice after all we'd been doing and the fact that the number one most popular race in EQ and EQ2 is the Dark Elves. So we're bringing the Dark Elves to you today. So that process always starts with concept art, and here's uh, some basic swords that they use. They're curved and elegant, just like almost everything else about the uh, Dark Elves. Their armor is designed to flow with their bodies as they move. Um, and here's a couple of renders of how those armors will look inside the game. Pretty cool. But wait. Because what I'm going to show you now is actual footage of the, uh, of the characters in the game, in the environment that the players helped us create, and you'll see how it all comes together as a single piece. So this is the Dark Elf female, and as you can see, the outfit that she's wearing absolutely matches the environment, her home environment that she, uh, that she lives inside. And we've done a lot with the emotions and the, and the physicality of the characters over the last year. So as you can see here, our emotive abilities have, have really come leaps and bounds. And she's really angry about something. <laughs> and then here's the male tear doll. And of course, his outfit does the same. It fits in with his uh, surroundings, make them look really strong and also very acrobatic. Uh, if you've read the lore, the tear doll are pretty amazing. And uh, we wanted to make sure that they looked like that inside the game. And then here's emotions for him. Every time I watch this, I try to read his lips. I'm pretty sure it's dark elfish. I don't know what they say, but I'm sure it's nice and really friendly. <laughs> so anyway, that's the dark elf race.
So in order to tell you a little bit about how our game plays, I'm going to take a, I'm going to go out on a limb and do a little bit of a risk and uh, tell you a story about how our character pr progresses through the game. So right now we've picked Dark Elf as our race. Now we need to pick a class. And uh, EverQuest Next is going to launch with 40 different classes that you can find, collect, and, and use. Um, at the start, you'll select your classes, a class from a shorter list, though, and, uh, and then you'll find the others as you play through the game. To show you our first two classes, the Warrior and the Wizard, I'd like to bring up senior producer for EverQuest Next and Landmark, Terry Michaels. Hey, Terry. Hi. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so, I know all of you guys were here last year, so you've already seen uh, what we showed off last year for the Warrior and the Wizard. Uh, but we wanted to take a little bit of time and, and show you what we've done over the past year uh, and how it progressed and, and, and how they're going to play in the game. Uh, so here's an image of our wizard, uh, and, and that class was really designed around the idea of, uh, you know, the stereotypical glass cannon. Right? He really doesn't want to be up in combat. He wants to stay at range. He wants to blow people or groups of people up because that's what his, his real forte is. Um, but we made sure to give him some abilities to deal with other situations and we'll talk about that. So let's take a look at what he looks like in combat. All right, so that's what the wizard looks like. But now I'm gonna take you through that uh, piece by piece so we can talk about what's going on so you can get an idea of a few of the abilities. Now the wizard will have a ton more abilities than we're talking about here, but this will give you a real idea of, of how they're gonna play in the game. Uh, so we're gonna go through that video again in pieces. So when a wizard finds himself confronted with a couple of enemies, what he's able to do is very easily control the battlefield and he uses um, Help out. Upheaval, thank you. <laughs> I forgot the first ability name. So uh, he uses upheaval and then he's very, e he can use arcane barrage, which is one of his basic attacks to finish him off. Uh, one of the cool things about upheaval that you guys saw was that it also destroys the terrain. And then we talked about the fact that the wizard really doesn't like to be up close and personal in combat, but sometimes they're gonna find themselves in that situation. And uh, so here's a, here's a scene where he's being ambushed by somebody that's coming out of that temple. Uh, what he has is he has the ability to use Vortex, which pulls the enemies into the, the spot that he's standing in and then teleports them a distance behind, where then he can finish them off with those ranged abilities that he really likes to use. And then with a little bit of warning, we're going to see the, the guard come running up here in just a second. He has the ability to use a, a spell called Stasis, which is an AE stun that stops them and, and roots them in their place. And then he can charge up his uh, Chromosphere, which is his most powerful ability, in order to just knock that guy into next week. And so that gives you an idea of a few of the abilities that the wizard's going to have. So what do you guys think? Do you think the wizard's going to be pretty cool to play? I can tell you we've had a lot of fun when we've been playing with it. Uh, all the designers get out and we do combat tests, and uh, the wizard happens to be one of my favorites, but that's the kind of class I always play in games. Uh, so now let's talk about the warrior. Okay, this is what the warrior looks like now. Uh, we've, we've gone with a different look. It's no longer Kishar from last year. Uh, I think she looks particularly, um, I, I guess I can say badass, you know. We're in Vegas, right? You know, I, I, I really like the way she looks. Um, the warrior is all about controlling the battlefield, deciding where and when you're going to fight. And, and she's just a force of destruction. So let's see what she looks like in combat.
So, again, the warrior's all about getting up close and personal, so they have abilities. Uh, she has the ability to move around very quickly using things like Furious Leap and Blade Dash, which are some of the abilities that we'll talk about here in just a second, uh, so that she can really decide where you engage enemies and how you deal with them. Uh, so we'll go through this in pieces again so we can talk about some of the individual abilities. So the warrior sees this group of guards coming through the gates, and she decides that the best way to deal with them is to ambush them from above. And she uses Furious Leap to jump from the, the top of the tower there and, and land on top of them, and then starts to whirlwind. And anybody who's not smart enough to get out, well, they, they have to pay the consequence of that. So one of the cool things about Whirlwind is you saw it, it was chewing up the terrain and the enemies alike. So you can use it to get through things or people, whichever one you want. Uh, and then, but a couple of those uh, guards were out of range. So she's gonna use Blade Dash, which is one of her more powerful abilities, to charge up and, and just destroy them. But sometimes she's faced with foes that are a little tougher than, than the ones we've seen so far. Uh, and she's going to use Furious Leap to jump up there. Uh, then she's going to start using Cripple, which stops them from being able to get away. It snares them so that you can make sure they can't run away from you. Because remember, she likes to be up close with you. Uh, and then she's going to use Shield Bash to finish them off. And so if that's the kind of game you like to play, that's what the Warrior's going to look like. You guys like that one too? All right. Thanks, guys. I'm going to turn it back over to Dave, and he'll tell you a little bit more about the game. Thanks, Terry. OK, so um, <clears throat> now let's get back to our story. So our, our character is now, uh, well, we chose the Dark Elf, and now we're going to choose between our starting uh, classes. And uh, just because we just showed the warrior, let's go ahead and do that and like, get up close and personal with our foes. So we'll become a tear doll warrior and go out looking for trouble. Well, it's not going to take you very long to find it in EverQuest Next. So let's talk about combat and how that works in EverQuest Next, because it's different than what you're used to in most MMOs. Combat is active, and it has a lot of skill, or it has a lot of elements of skill in it. You'll need to position your body and facing to maximize your attacks, and you'll also need to watch the speed of your targets so that you can time your attacks. Being aware of your surroundings and watching what your targets are doing will be key to your survival. Every situation is different, and you'll need to use your abilities cleverly and appropriately. You can absolutely become good at combat because skill is definitely rewarded in this game. OK, so far? OK. So let's go back to our character and talk a little bit about his advancement and uh, how he picks up new classes and, uh, and gets, uh, gets better. So returning to our characters, uh, you start traveling around and you, let's say you run into a guy being accosted by brigands on the side of a road. And you decide that you're going to get in the way and, uh, and save him. Well, you do that, and then you find out that this guy is a priest of Nathaniel. So you befriend him a little bit, and then he asks you to be his bodyguard on a journey to a nearby city. So you go ahead and travel with him, and there's a series of adventures. Well, eventually this guy decides that you're all right, and he, he uh, offers to teach you how to become a cleric. Well, this would be your opportunity to learn a second class and have a warrior and a cleric. And to run us through what a cleric can do in this game, well, let's bring out lead designer Darren McPherson, and he can explain exactly what that is. <laughs> So can you guess who this is? This, I had all these lines prepared and Dave just ruined it with that segue. But, so this is our cleric. So last year we spoke to you about support classes. And I know some of you were scared, right? And we said the support class, we really didn't want the support class to be relegated to standing behind the enemy line, the battlefield, and managing health bars, and, and that was your role. But we still really do want you to be able to be heroic, and to rescue people, because I've played a healer, and I know how good it feels to save the day. And we want to give you those opportunities. We also require that you be active and, and that you can participate in the battle, because that's more fun than watching UI. We have good UI, but it's not that amazing. So let's run through this video, and you'll see how the cleric plays.
So how was that? Is that okay? So this is the first of our support, the, the support characters that we're going to introduce. And he's pretty amazing. Let me walk you through this and give you a play-by-play. -play. So that shield's pretty cool, right? We like that. So this is one of the shields that not only will you see in EQNX, but if you were paying attention to the Landmark uh, panel, that's a shield that you'll see in Landmark as well. So it's pretty cool. So now, this, uh, this next scene, he sees a, a beleaguered uh, ally who is being surrounded by foes, and he uses an ability called Blessed Hammer. And Blessed Hammer has got a wonderful combination of both offense and support. When he casts it on an ally, it regenerates their armor. Remember we talked about their armor resource. When he casts it on enemies, it deals damage to them. So this is how he wades into battle as he, he uses this ability. So let's watch. Clearly a pickup group because that guy just ran ahead. Um, <laughs> but is, are there any clerics out here? Any clerics in the audience? Yeah. Okay, so you've always been equipped to uh, to deal with stupid, and <laughs> we give you the ability to deal with stupid in lots of ways. Okay. So here we're going to use an ability called intercession, and it's going to allow you to charge toward enemies and knock them back. Does damage to them, but if an ally is nearby, and this is meant to rescue, right? If an ally is nearby, it rejuvenates their armor again. So you charge into battle and you rescue, and this is a very visceral and wonderful feeling, and it's better than watching UI bars. Let's watch it. <laughs> you do? You so that was really quick, right? We don't, we don't mess around. The cleric doesn't mess around. Okay, so we also stress, not only we stress, you know, being able to be a good support class and being able to be mobile on the battlefield, be able to move around and be where the emergencies are, we want you to be a leader as well. Someone said battle cleric out in the audience. You are correct, right? This is our model for what this class should be. So he's going to use now Heaven's Vengeance, and Heaven's Vengeance marks a big area, and it becomes a beacon for all of his allies. Any allies within that get a big damage buff and any enemies within it are harmed. So this is a wonderful thing. If you see that yellow, that yellow globe, you run in there and you help your, your allies. So these are just some of the abilities. So do you, what do you think? You like that? This is just a few of the abilities that the cleric has, but you guys understand his motif, what our goal and our theme is. Does this sound like it would be fun to play? Yeah. Okay. So, we also would like to show you. Well, I'm not going to. So, we'll talk about this in a minute. So what is typically more dull than Mark Tuttle's jokes? <laughs> watching, watching a cleric and a warrior do combat, right? Warrior can't harm the cleric because the, the, the cleric's just going to heal himself over and over again. So eventually when he runs out of mana 40 minutes later, the combat can, can, uh, can end. And people have nodded off by then. But we saw just now a preview of what it is to be a skill-based cleric and be able to hold your own. And this is a goal for all of our classes, regardless of whether you're a support class or an offensive class or a defense class like the, like the warrior. You know, the warrior, as, as, uh, as Mr. Michael said earlier, um, is a very brute force kind of guy. And he tries to tackle problems. Let's watch this. He tries to tackle these problems in that way. So the warrior is... I like to think of him as equal parts, um, very possessive friend. Like he wants to control the battlefield, and he says, "Oh, that you're fighting in that area. No, that area is mine. And oh, you're fighting over there. That area is also mine." 
Um, and, oh, you're fighting with my friends? No, those are mine. So he likes to move around. And he's also equal parts Kool-Aid man, because he destroys lots of stuff. So he's going to try to go in, and he's going to jump in, and he's going to furious leap and whirlwind, because that's how he took care of the dark elves or the humans before. Let's see what happens. OK, so uh, Ryan, Ryan, uh, Ryan Shannon was our, was our cleric, and he's a pretty highly skilled uh, player. And he just moved out of the whirlwind. And then he healed himself up using Bloods and Hammer. So the warrior is tackling this, and I think he's going to be disappointed. In the next clip, you're going you're to see the warrior's got a wonderful ability that we demonstrated earlier called Blade Dash. And that's what you would use to close with a character, but it, you have to line it up. You should go straight. So like a matador, right, he just <laughs> sidesteps out of the way, and the warrior's blown an ability, and now it gives the, uh, the cleric an opportunity to use a, an ability we haven't shown you, um, which is going to be, um, he's done Heaven's Vengeance, and he's going to use Blinding Wrath that stuns and does a lot of damage. So faced with all this, I think the warrior is, uh, is going to lick his wounds. He's going to run away. Now, the circumstances could have been different, and the warrior could have won. Um, they're all equally, uh, equally amazing. But we believe that this sort of balance between the classes is going to achieve a much more fulfilling gameplay for, uh, for all the classes. Pass it off to you, Dave. Fantastic job. <laughs> And the, the quote of the presentation just has to be, Kool-Aid man. <laughs> he, <laughs> he didn't do that in rehearsal. That's great. So anyway, um, let's get back to our character again. So now we have the warrior and the cleric classes at our disposal, and it's time to strike out into the unknown. Well, let's talk a little bit about how that happens. The world is filled with all kinds of opportunities for adventure, and the content is changing all the time. It's pushed by events, both player-driven um, uh, both player driven choices and, of course, <laughs> with us messing around with the world to keep it entertaining. Um, the game keeps track of everything that you've done, and it gives you hints on the things that you might like to do. You get a lot of those tips from talking to NPCs and finding out what's going on in the world, but you also get them from your companion book, which is called The Row Song. Now, The Row Song will give you all kinds of just tips and hints and suggestions about where you might go. So let's talk about what our character finds in the world. He decides by checking the row song that there's a, he hears about rumors of darkness in a nearby forest named Kithakor. So he journeys there and what he finds is that there's a war going on between the night raids and the dryads for control of the forest. He, being a dark elf warrior, decides to go check out with the night race, and they tell him that if, they'll, if he'll help them uh, overcome the dryads, they'll teach him knowledge that they have at their disposal. So he goes and does that, and through a series of adventures, he finally earns the opportunity to learn the elementalist class. And to tell you more about the elementalist, we'll bring up Michael Mann, the uh, lead uh, systems design, uh, designer for EverQuest Next and Landmark. Hello, everyone. So as Dave told you, uh, I'm going to tell you about the Elementalist. So uh, the Elementalist is a caster class. Uh, he likes to cast ice and fire spells mostly. And he, what he really excels at is controlling the battlefield, right? We've talked about control a lot. And it's actually a really important part of the game. In a game where there's you know, heroic movement, you're moving all over the place and dashing around, it's kind of an important to have a guy that says, hey, don't go there. Uh, and if you go there, you're going to take a lot of damage, right? Don't, you know, don't say I didn't warn you. Uh, so we're going to check him out, and then I'll, I'll explain what's going on afterwards.
So he's, he's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> So, in the first section, uh, you see him, when the soldier walks up to him, he's casting an ability called Ice Shards. And what it does is it shoots three ice bolts out in front of him. And I, I mentioned, or I think I mentioned earlier, he actually does more damage the closer you get to him. So he's extra dangerous. He's kind of a, you know, extra risk versus reward, right? Uh, and what Ice Shards does, when you get close to him, you actually get hit with multiple bolts. And so he, you know, it, it deals a little bit extra damage. Uh, and then what you saw, uh, there's a big fire pillar that he placed down. Uh, and it, it'll make you do like the fire dance. Did you guys check that out? You'll, you'll see it in a second. Uh, but that, that's one of those spells that says, hey, don't go in this spot. It does a ton of damage over time and he can actually place multiple out uh, at a time. And so, we'll show you. So the, the fire dance kind of reminds me of the tribal dance in Landmark, but that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll work on it over time. Uh, so the next sequence uh, has the elementalist being uh, overwhelmed by uh, three other soldiers, right? And it, it kind of, th this section kind of shows how the abilities work together. Uh, he has two abilities, uh, one's called Flash Freeze and the other is called Elemental Blast. Flash Freeze is extra cool. Uh, no. uh, <laughs> I, I didn't mean to, uh, anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> I know, right, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Mark wrote that, exactly. Um, so uh, he slams his, <laughs> slams his staff down and freezes the ground. And what's really cool about, about our game is it doesn't just throw a decal down there. It actually freezes the terrain, right? It turns it into ice. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, later on why that's extra important. But when the enemies are standing on the ice, he has an ability called Elemental Blast. And when he uses that and they're standing on ice, they get frozen. And so that sort of ability interaction is, is going to be apparent in, in our game and, and all over the place. So let's check it out. See the, yeah, all right. Um, so <laughs> so uh, as Darren was saying, the warrior is uh, extra possessive. You saw him kind of jump in and be like, those are my enemies, right? But uh, <laughs> uh, in this next scene, what you're gonna see is uh, he, the elementalist casts flash freeze again. And you remember how I was talking about it actually changing the, ter the terrain? Well, all of our different types of terrain have different toughness strengths, right? And so some are more difficult to break through than others. The warrior comes in, tries to you know, whirlwind a hole in the ground, but you see it doesn't work. Um, and so after the flash freeze, the uh, warrior comes in and the ice is more brittle and they're able to break through the ground and get to the next fight. And that's a... I guess the next fight is in the uh, Dark Elf market underneath the city, so it's, it's a dangerous place. Anyway, back to you, Dave. <laughs> One of the things I really like about the combat abilities, and uh, this is off script, so somebody's going to hit me later. Uh, one of the things I really like about him is the fact that uh, different characters uh, mix and match with other, uh, other classes' abilities to really good effect. And um, it's not just um, destroying your opponents, but it's also using the environment around you, uh, toppling pillars, causing damage to things to change the situation in the environment around you. And the, the fact that the abilities can be used intelligently, like to extend uh, long movements, like maybe you can jump and then double jump and then use an, a, a teleport ability to go even further, those kinds of things make the combat combat very fluid and you need to be situationally aware all the time because you can really change the environment by just being a smart player, which is what we really want out of this game. We want you to be able to play the game and get great at it. So anyway, let's get back to our story. Um, by the time uh, our character has uh, learned how to be an elementalist and uh, done his thing in Kithikor, uh, he's, he's uh, found some good gear and he's got a few classes under his belt. So um, he wants to make a difference in the world, and the easiest, the biggest, uh, 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 easiest way to make an impact in our world is to participate in rallying calls. Now, rallying calls are the huge story arcs that we introduce and run through the worlds. There's several of them going on all the time, and you guys choose what's interesting to you. So depending upon what you choose and what you do when you get there, you can quite literally change your world. So. 
Our character hears about the tear doll um, recovering and restoring a lost, a long forgotten citadel that was abandoned before the Dragon Wars. And if you've read the lore, you know what I'm talking about with the Dragon Wars. Um, so you, we journey there and uh, participate in a whole bunch of different kinds of adventures. There's dozens of adventures that are available at this citadel. Um, and you can delve down into the dungeons, you can pursue ancient mysteries, you can help this tear doll do all kinds of different things uh, and generally support them in their cause. In particular, this time around, we decide to delve into the catacombs. And while we're down there, we find uh, rumors and clues to an ancient discipline known as the Tempest. So we start on an extended quest to find out more about that, and players around us are all doing that sort of thing also. But eventually, we become part of a clandestine order that focuses on the single element of lightning. And to tell you about the Tempest, and you're going to like this one, uh, let's bring back up Michael Mann, the lead designer, uh, lead system designer for EverQuest Next in Landmark. Hello again. I, I almost forgot to come up here. Did you guys see that? I, was, I guess I shouldn't have said anything. Anyway, so this is this is the Tempest. Uh, the Tempest is a class that's uh, extra focused on heroic movement. Uh, she's she's one of my favorite classes to talk about. Right? It's and you'll, you'll see why in a moment. She's, she's really, uh, really awesome. But she focuses on heroic movement, and she moves around the, the, the uh, combat area, and she f kind of hones in on single targets and then annihilates them. Uh, so check, check her out in action. Did you guys catch all that? It's pretty good. Uh, I was told not to use uh, lightning fast as a, as a reference, but anyway. Um, so what happens here is you can, uh, the Tempest is watching the fight from kind of up in a, a balcony in the, uh, in the Dark Elf City. And she looks down the battlefield and she spots the, the cleric being the person that's really controlling the area, right? She's, uh, the cleric's bolstering his allies. And so she says, hey, you know what? I'm gonna glide down there and I'm gonna take care of business. Uh, she glides down and uses an ability called Spark Rush. Spark Rush is, is an ability that allows her to turn into lightning and dash in whatever direction she's moving, right? So uh, you can use it to dodge, you can use it to engage, you can use it for all sorts of things. Uh, maybe just to look cool, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I do on the, on the test server all the time. I just uh, but she, so she uses a spark rush to engage and then finishes uh, the cleric off with lightning strike. So let's check it out. So after the Tempest finishes off the Cleric, uh, she kind of wants to just take care of the rest of the guys, right? Uh, most of the time she focuses on single target damage, because I like to refer to her as kind of like a druid assassin, right? Uh, but she also has abilities that can do, to do uh, damage to multiple people. Uh, in the next scene, you'll see her uh, using Spark Rush to, to uh, dodge to the side, but Cyclone is, is the next biggest ability. And because she's a, a class strongly built around heroic movement, Cyclone also moves her forward. Uh, but it does some other things. It does a ton of damage, and it also uh, heals her armor to make her a little more sustainable because, uh, you know, sometimes she'll get hit. Maybe not here, but, you know, uh, there are other cases. And so let's, let's check her out. So these are just a, a, a few of the abilities uh, that the Tempest has, uh, and we, what we really want to show you is the heroic movement and using the battlefield to your advantage. Uh, we'll be talking more about, about classes later on today at the panels at 6, uh, six o'clock, uh, so I hope to see you guys there. If you did. And now you know why crowd control is so important in this game. <laughs> that Tempest, woo. Okay, so. 
Um, it turns out that everybody was really successful uh, at, doing, at uh, participating in the rallying call, found all kinds of really valuable treasures, uh, uncovered uh, really cool mysteries, and uh, generally got a great reputation for helping the tear doll uh, create something magnificent, which of course made the brigands in the area totally jealous, and they formed together underneath the warlord, and then they attack the citadel as part of the rallying call. Now, we've talked about that kind of thing before, but this time around we have enough stuff done in the game that we put together a really rough cut of what a battle like that might actually look like. So what you're seeing in this next video is real in-game footage, still a little rough, but you'll see the potential. There has never been another game like EverQuest Next. Everything changes all of the time. And you create most of that change, and the world reacts to what you choose. So get ready to see a lot more of this game in the coming year. Thank you.